Hey everyone, in this video I want to explore thinking about disaster recovery for the services that we deploy in Azure and maybe even thinking about using Azure for disaster recovery for services in other clouds or on-premises. As always, if this is useful, please like, subscribe, comment and share and hit that bell icon to get notified of new content. Now it can be really tempting to just think, hey, we have Azure and when I deploy things to Azure as if by magic, then everything we deploy is just always going to be available. I don't have to think about it, it's in the cloud. And the cloud is everywhere, so when I deploy to that service, I don't have to worry about anything else. And there's this whole idea that there's no such thing as the cloud, it's just someone else's PC. I think there's a lot more to it than that. But realize, yes, we have cloud services, but fundamentally, there are still physical buildings, there are still racks of servers, and there are things that can go wrong. So things can fail at different levels, at a node level, a rack level, maybe even a facility level. And so it's really not magic. There are components we have to think about. And so we have to leverage different architectures and technologies to make sure our services are resilient. Now, when we talk about disaster recovery, we're really thinking about resiliency and failover between regions. So I can think about, well, maybe I've got two regions for this conversation. So I can think, okay, I've got kind of over here, my region two. For example, maybe that's East US. And I can think about, hey, there's another region over here. Maybe that is West US. Again, just, just examples. And there are many, many regions. Like if we go and look, we can look at the actual Microsoft documentation. And here we can see, we'll look in the United States, there's Central US, East US, East US 2, East US 3 is coming soon. There's this whole list of different regions available to us in the US alone. And then there are ones in kind of Brazil, Canada, I can change and I can go and look at Europe, for example, France, Austria, Norway, you kind of name it. There are really regions all throughout the world. And a region, remember we often think about in terms of how do we define that region, it's kind of that two millisecond latency envelope. So there might be multiple physical facilities that actually make up that region. So I can think within that region, they may be actually exposed to me. In certain regions, we have things like availability zones. So I would see kind of an AZ1, AZ2, AZ3, where they have independent cooling, power, networking, IE communications. And I would use those for high availability. So that's separate from disaster recovery. We think about high availability, availability zones, fault domains, i.e. certain racks. We think about load balancers. And these give us protection from things like a node failure or a rack failure, maybe even a building level, a facility level failure. Now within that region, because it's that very small latency envelope, we can typically do things like synchronous replication where we don't acknowledge a write, for example, until it's been written to a majority of members. So there's some sort of quorum. I might have active, active configurations. I can have load balancers distributing between them. That's a very simple thing. And if you're curious about availability zones, I did a deep dive video on that. We can go and see more detail. But if you think about disaster recovery, that's where I think about, I want a bigger distance between them. I might think about, I want hundreds of miles between where maybe I think about maybe my primary is running and where my disaster recovery would be. Because it's all about that blast radius. Within a region, sure, I might have resiliency against a, a node failure, rack failure, maybe even a building, but some kind of natural disaster could impact all of those. So for disaster recovery purposes, I wanna think about a huge distance between them 
so that, hey, if there was some natural disaster, it's not gonna impact my disaster recovery region. Or if it did, I've probably got bigger problems because if they're hundreds of miles away and that natural disaster impacted both of them, it's probably a bad day for everyone. Now, when I think about regions to pick, Microsoft has a certain natural peering. It actually creates these pairs of paired regions. And we can see those in the documentation. Again, all of these are linked in the description below. So they have their own paired regions. So you can see here, it names kind of, hey, the idea of the different pairs that make up how it uses certain services. Now, I don't have to use these pairings for a lot of services, I can pick my own. Some services do align to this. Things like Azure Storage, Geo Redundant Storage, Azure Key Vault, uh, Azure Backup use these pairings. There are also some benefits to using these pairings because what happens is, if you think about, well, Microsoft has to deploy our updates. Now, when it deploys out service updates, it's super careful that it won't deploy the same update to paired regions. Because most likely, customers are using those pairings for its disaster recovery. So if it rolled out an update, let's say, to the storage provider, and it caused a problem, we well, wouldn't want that same update rolled out to the paired regions, because then it would take out the DR region as well. So they don't roll out updates to the same time to the paired regions. So using those pairings does give you some additional resiliency from Microsoft kind of rolling out their updates. So there's a benefit to that. Now, as I think about actually using these then, I, I wanna use disaster recovery. I have to understand what is my workload. Because depending on my workload, it's gonna impact what exactly I can do. If you think about your resource, now your resource, your workload you're doing, well, it's using some kind of resource. Now that resource could be many different things. That resource, for example, could be a virtual machine. It could be some kind of container. It could be something else. But then on that resource actually runs kind of an operating system there may be some kind of middleware, some kind of runtime, and then you actually get to your app, and maybe, potentially, there's kind of data as well. So these different levels to our workload. Now, what I have access to varies depending on which Azure service I'm using. If, for example, I'm using an IaaS virtual machine, well then I kind of see all of this. So basically getting a, a VM in the cloud. If I'm using a PaaS service, well then I really only see that. There's still a fundamental resource and OS and runtimes, but I don't really have any access to those things. With PaaS, I just focus on the application. Now, when I think about, okay, there's these different levels I can actually use, well, then I can actually think about, well, there's different options I can have to achieve that disaster recovery. Because the whole idea is, hey, look, I'm running here, something bad happens, I now wanna be running over there. So how do I suddenly run over there? Well, I can think about, okay, these are hundreds of miles apart, what are some of the options I could do? Well, certainly, I could just maybe recreate the resources. So in the event of a disaster, I'll just recreate them. I have some template, for example, I used infrastructure as code. I can just recreate, or maybe even, this is horrible, I go to the portal and I click, 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 and I recreate my resource. Maybe I can perform a backup restore. I have my backup data available to me in the other region. Maybe the backup's taken there and then replicated over and I can do a cross-region restore. I could res restore my resource over in this region. Or, and it kind of builds into this, I'm doing some kind of replication. Now, as we just store, if I wanted to do a backup restore cross-region, it would have to be replicating the backup data across the regions anyway. 
Now, when I think about replication, remember all these layers? Well, obviously I can replicate all those different layers, depending on what my service is. Maybe I'm replicating at the application level. If it was a database, maybe it's SQL or WizOn, for example, or some extension to another database that lets it replicate. Maybe I'm replicating at the OS level, some agent inside the operating system that, hey, captures the changes to disk as they flow through the volume driver, the file system, etc., and sends it somewhere else. Maybe just the platform itself has a native replication. For example, if I had an Azure Storage account, it has its own option to do the replication. So we have these different potential options on how do I get my thing running in that kind of disaster recovery region. And the right one is gonna depend on a number of factors. I'm gonna go into more detail on this. But first of all, realize not everything is your problem. Most resources we do deploy into a region, a storage account, a VM, a container, an app service, a database instance, they deploy into a region. And I've got videos on understanding why most things deploy into a region. But realize there are some services that don't deploy into a region. Some of them are just globally redundant natively. For example, I can think of things like Azure AD. Azure AD is a global kind of service. It just has instances replicated over multiple data centers. It's not my job to worry about trying to make Azure AD resilient in a regional failure scenario. Things like the content delivery network. That's another service where I can host content that's automatically replicated out. Things like Azure Static Web Apps, well, they actually use the CDN. So I don't deploy an Azure Static Web App to a particular region, it just uses that CDN so it's geographically distributed. There are certain geo services. For example, things like Front Door, where it geo balances HTTP, HTTPS traffic. Things like Traffic Manager. It's kind of a global DNS resolution system to point to other services. They are just globally resilient and built in. So don't have to worry. That's not my job to think about those. But for most other things, they deploy to a region so I have to think about, okay, what happens if there's some kind of regional problem? Now I'm gonna focus initially on the idea of failing over, but realize I might also run active-active. I'm actually running instances in multiple regions, and we'll come back to that later on, but that would kind of solve that problem as well, because hey, they're just running in multiple regions, so in a way I'm resilient against some kind of regional failure already. But let's think about for a second, okay, I want to think about disaster recovery for my workload. Now we need to understand the requirements of the protection. So what are the requirements for the disaster recovery? And there's a whole set of things we need to know. I need to understand the application, dependencies. But before I get to any of that, there's kind of a key must know. So what I must know Really before anything else, there's two things. The first one is something called the recovery point objective. And you'll hear this called kind of RPO. Recovery point objective is really saying, well, <laughs> How much can I lose? That could be five minutes, maybe it's one hour, maybe it's one day. So in the event of some unexpected disaster, how much data can I lose? Now you might instantly say nothing, I can lose no data. Okay, well that's gonna require a million dollar solution. Oh, okay, well maybe I can lose five or 10 minutes. Okay, that's a lot more manageable. So we need to be realistic about what are these numbers? Because yes, you can say, I can't lose anything. I can't be down for any amount of time. Well, okay, it's gonna cost me millions and millions of dollars. Well, actually, I can lose five minutes. I can be down for half an hour. 
that would be okay in an unplanned, in a planned scenario, I an unplanned would be, where did my data center go? And so I'm, I'm gonna to expect to lose some data because it's an unexpected, suddenly I just lose my resources. Then there's kind of a, an expected failover. I, I see a storm coming. I have a few hours notice. I can cleanly stop services, complete some replication and start them up. I would not anticipate having any unexpected data loss. So I need to know what amount of data I can survive losing. So I need to know that. And then I need to know what is my recovery time objective. So you might hear RTO. And this is really about, well, how long to be operational. I maybe that's 30 minutes, maybe that's four hours, maybe it's three days, different values. There's not a right or wrong here, it depends on the service. If this was a time tracking application for employees or an expense submission site, you know, if it's down for a few days, it's really not the end of the world. That's completely different from, hey, this is the shopping cart for my online business. I can be down for five minutes. So again, I wanna be realistic with what these are because these are completely gonna drive what solution I use. Now, one additional thing to think about with this recovery point objective. Yes, this is how much data can I lose? but realize this does tie in a little bit to my recovery time objective. Let's say this is 10 minutes. I can lose 10 minutes of data. Okay, so I've got a solution in place that maybe replicates every five minutes, so I'm safe. But if my recovery time objective, let's say was 10 minutes, it takes me 10 minutes to fail over. Okay, so I had a backup of five minutes, then it takes me 10 minutes to get up and running, so that's 15 minutes. What was happening to maybe transactions in between that time? Are they stored somewhere so they'll get played in, in which case I'm good, I'm not losing any data? Or is there some component that's just gonna dump the transactions and fail? Well, now I might be actually losing more than that five expected minutes because of the replication, because I'm actually down for a period of time. So I have to kind of think about that as well. So we understand those things, and these are gonna drive uh, a lot of kind of key points about how we architect our solution. Now we drew these idea of layers, the OS, the app, the actual resource itself. When I think about replicating, I can replicate at those different things. Now I can imagine I've got these two regions and I'm thinking about replication right here. So I wanna kind of expand out this idea of kind of replication. That's what we're gonna focus on. Typically the best performance, the least data loss, the fastest uptime, the fastest failover would be if I replicate at the app level. So there's some kind of thing built into the service itself that does replication. For example, if it was a database, if it was SQL, it has its own kind of native always on replication. Now it's typically gonna be, all of these are gonna be asynchronous. Remember the point of asynchronous compared to synchronous, so with synchronous, I don't acknowledge the write until I've written it to multiple places. That doesn't work very well if there's hundreds of miles between them because it takes time to send that request and get the response back. So if I have an app performing transactions and it has to wait for this latency, this maybe 30, 40 milliseconds, it's really gonna impact my performance. So asynchronous says, hey, it acknowledges the transaction as soon as it's written to the local region, and then on a kind of, as quick as it can, or maybe on a schedule, it then sends it over to the other region. Obviously, because of that asynchronous nature, I could lose data because if this went down before it had sent it to the other side, well, I've lost that transaction. So that's why asynchronous, there's always the risk of loss of data. But we kind of have to balance that 
because otherwise would really impact the performance of the app if it had to wait for that maybe huge latency every single time. But that's something we can decide about. And often for these services, I might actually be how to have kind of a read access on this side. So this was a database. Hey, I can read right on this side, but maybe I can get read access on the other side. I can't write to it because most databases are kind of a single uh, write scenario. But maybe I can read this and that's gonna come into play a little bit later on. Maybe I replicate at the operating system level. So there's solutions like Azure Site Recovery, for example. This runs a kind of mobility service inside the operating system. It captures things as it flows through the file system to the volume driver. This mobility service grabs that and sends it to a service on the other side where it writes it to disk. And then it can create a VM and attach to that disk if I actually perform a failover. Maybe I replicate the resource level. So maybe actually here I have some native replication. That depends on the service. Maybe for example, it's a storage account and I can turn on something like GRS. So it's doing that geo redundancy. Maybe I just have a backup at some level. And what I can actually do is I can actually take the backup data and replicate it over. And then I could obviously restore over onto the other side. So over here, I could do a restore of that data. Um, for example, Azure Backup, I can turn on that geo-redundant option. And then there's another option where I just recreate it. Now obviously that's only gonna work if there's no state that I care about, i.e. data. But if it was some kind of dumb front end that didn't have any state, hey, that's, that's actually probably a really good option. Because realize there's all these different layers, there's ways I can do this, but what happens is as I kind of go up from basic levels to app level replication, my cost goes up. As I move up the layers, like an app level database replication typically will cost more because I have multiple instances of the database actually running. So there's more resource running, cost me more money compared to maybe saying where, oh, it's just replicating at a disk level. There's no compute resource running on the other end. But the downside of that is my failover speed. say speed, there's more to it than that, will actually go down. Because again, if it's at the service level, hey, it's, there's a service running, it's receiving the transactions, it's checking them, it's ready to fail over really, really quick. Whereas if it's like an OS level, well, the database could be dirty, don't really know exact state, may have to do some cleanup. If it's a disk level, well then I have to like recreate the VM and attach it. So it's gonna take longer. So there are these pros and cons depending on exactly what model uh, I'm actually using and how important that service is and what is that recovery point and recovery time objective. Realize it's not one solution meets all. And we'll talk about this. I don't have to pick one for my entire application. You may also wonder about this recreation. How do I recreate? Well. That's why we were stressing that infrastructure as code, DevOps. If all of my resources are defined by templates, if they're pushed by a pipeline, it's actually easy for me to recreate things. I can just replay it, I can redeploy that template. So that's again why we don't like the idea of creating things in the portal. I can't recreate from that. So we have all these things. So now I wanna think about, okay, what else do we need to know? Well, our application has a certain architecture. Now I might start off saying, okay, my application, I have a web front end. Now maybe that web front end are a group of virtual machines. Maybe my web front end is their containers on an AKS cluster. Whatever it is, there's some multiple instances of my service. Now, to actually get to the service, remember these are all within one region, I have a load balancer. In this case, it's offering a web service. 
So I use kind of Azure App Gateway with Web Application Firewall to distribute an app option. Maybe it's a standard load balancer. And this actually uses a public IP. Oh, can't write today. So this is a public IP. It's accessible via the internet. So that's actually how that is connected to. Okay, so then, so this is one kind of layer of my service. It then goes and talks to a serverless layer, for example. Uh, maybe this is kind of Azure Functions. So remember, this just spins up kind of little jobs as the work comes in. So these then communicate, and this is another layer. And actually, now I think about it, that web front end actually pulls some resources from a storage account. So I also have kind of a storage account that is kind of read from, I've got some artifacts in there. Maybe it's images, probably should use a CDM, but I don't, I use a storage account, which is in a region. And that middle tier, well that middle tier, it goes and talks to a database. So I have some database in here, which it does kind of read and write actions against. So I have all these different elements. Okay, that's fantastic. I understand my application. What else does it depend upon? I need to understand every element. Okay, so people get to it from the public IP. These are the layers of my application. What else does it use? Um, well, actually, people authenticate and I'm using Azure AD for that. So okay, I have reliance on Azure AD as well. I'm also using um, managed identity. Well, that ties into Azure AD. Just understand all of the different requirements you have. For example, if these were maybe virtual machines that were domain joined, well, then I have a reliance on Active Directory domain controllers, which maybe has reliance then on DNS which maybe relies on some network communication. So you need to think about all of the different levels that may actually come into play. And this database maybe is Postgres, could be PaaS, it could be IaaS, could be running on a virtual machine. Again, a virtual machine, maybe it's domain joined. I'm gonna say I'm using PaaS. I'm using the Azure Managed Postgres SQL database on this one. But you need to understand all of the dependencies. Now, once I understand that, there's one key question I want to answer. And my question is, where is the state? That's what I care about. Where's the state? Well, there's no state in the app gateway. There's no state in the web front end. There's not really any state in the Azure function. My state is in the database. And I could also potentially argue, well, actually these artifacts change. Maybe there's some kind of state in there as well. So I have to think about, that's the stuff I need to protect the most. Because remember our options. Our options are, hey, I can replicate stuff or I can recreate stuff. Or maybe I can just do backup restore. If there's no state in a, in a layer, I probably don't bother with any of those things. I would just recreate it. Now, potentially there might be configuration of a service that's maybe really complex, in which case some services let you back up and restore the config. But in terms of the resources themselves, I would not bother backing them up if I can just recreate them. And we'll come back to kind of what that means in a second. But if it's got state, well then I have to do something. I can't just recreate it. I can't recreate data that's in another region. So, hey, where's the state? Okay, well, there's state here in this storage account, and there's state here in this database. So I care about that. Now for the database, remember we have different options. And the one we pick is gonna depend on that recovery point objective to recovery time objective. If it was a very small recovery point objective, I can't lose much data, almost certainly I'm gonna use some database native replication. Potentially if it was a, maybe not available for some reason, it's running an IaaS VM, I could maybe do an OS replication. Again, if it was an IaaS virtual machine, and that would only work again if it was IaaS. If it's PaaS, 
OS replication, I don't have any access to that. Or maybe if it's a really long recovery point objective, again, maybe it's that time logging system. Um, I can look, people can resubmit their time. It's not the end of the world. Maybe have a backup. We back up every 12 hours. Worst case, people re-enter their time for the last 12 hours. Because it comes down to cost, remember? This is gonna cost me a lot more than just having a backup sent somewhere. So I don't just say, hey, for all my databases, I'm gonna use database replication. What's the right one for a particular service? Again, that shopping cart of transactions, I maybe really cannot lose anything. I, I cannot afford to lose transactions. Now, maybe there's a way I can asynchronously replicate and maybe I can replay transactions in the event of some kind of disaster, but I have to think about that. And pretty much all of the database solutions in Azure have some kind of database replication. For example, if I was to look at like the Postgres documentation, it has the ability to have a cross-region replica. So again, and it talks about, hey, this is really useful for disaster recovery planning. Things like Azure SQL Database, I can have geo-replication. I can have that asynchronous, obviously it's stressing the asynchronous level I can absolutely do that. Now, if I was just using a regular backup, if I jump over here for a second, look at my recovery services vaults, many solutions today will let you actually do a cross-region restore, i.e. my backup vault, if I look at my backup vault, we set up the backup vault in its configuration to actually be, when this is gonna decide to load, we're gonna have that as geo-redundant. So we can see here, it's geo-redundant. And notice here I could set the option to enable cross-region restore. So not only would the data be replicated across regions, so hey, I'm replicating to the other region, let's say I'm doing a backup of a database or a VM, I could actually restore it to the other region. So that's a, a useful capability. So when I think about their state, I need something to be replicating that state. That, that's the key point to make sure I'm resilient. Okay, what about recreation then? So I talked about, hey, anything without state, I'll just recreate. I made that nice and easy, simple. Well how do you recreate the things? How do I create things in the first place? So the point here is ideally I'm using infrastructure as code. Now if we use infrastructure as code, most likely what we actually have is we have some kind of repository. So I have a repo. And the nice thing is most kind of repositories like GitHub or Azure DevOps, they are already geo-distributed. It's just native. They're not deployed into a region. My repo is not tied to South Central US. It is just geographically distributed. I don't have to worry about a particular region having my repo in it. That's not my problem. So then, and also Azure AD is also geo-distributed, not saying I have to worry about. That kind of applies across there. Now what I'd probably do is I have a pipeline so when I have some kind of pipeline, my CI, CD, my DevOps, my continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, I have my pipeline. My pipeline gets things from the repo. And then it can do that recreation. I can rerun it to recreate my resources. Now I have to think about well, what is all of the different parts my pipeline may use. Yes, it may pull things from a repo, my code, um, certain releases of my code. But also, imagine I'm deploying containers. Well, if I'm deploying containers, there's probably a container registry which has my images in it. If it's a virtual machine, I might have a shared image gallery with my VM images on it. So I need to make sure they are resilient. So that's just automatically resilient for me. I need to make sure my images, I don't have to recreate them. Yes, 
as long as I've got the repo, I could rebuild the container image. I could do a Docker build. Yes, maybe I'm using Packer or Azure VM image builder. I could rebuild the VM images, but I don't want to mess with that. So I want to make sure I add replicas to these things, which essentially now makes this geo-distributed. There's going to be a copy of that in the other region because these get pulled in to the pipeline to do that recreation. And remember, these, kind of going on down, these are regional by default. So I need to add those replicas to make that resilient. So this is kind of a, a key point. This is how we recreate, this is why we stress infrastructure as code and DevOps and all those things. It's not just, hey, it's neater to do this stuff. It's, it's really gonna light up a lot of great scenarios in those disaster type scenarios. Now realize this recreation thing, it does actually come back to the recovery time objective a little bit. Because remember, creating things takes time. So this decision to recreate, well, it does actually depend on that recovery time objective. If it's fairly long, I probably have the time to recreate them. If it's short, and this really depends on kind of your definitions and how many resources you're creating, well then maybe I need kind of that warm standby. Either they're up and running, and I can just get them. But again, the cost goes up. We always try and, especially if it's DR, it's something we hope we never use. So we really want it to be as cheap as we possibly can. Ideally, in the event of a disaster, hey, then we spring into life and we trigger something that actually goes and creates stuff. But ideally, it's not costing us much money. It's that seatbelt we hope we never use. So that's thinking about adding in that RTO um, recreation. Remember, PaaS services, um, they pretty much always deploy to a region. And so if I want a PaaS service on kind of warm standby, I'm just going to deploy instances to multiple regions. My AKS clusters, my app service plans, whatever that might be, they're just going to have instances stood up in multiple regions there. There really is no global version of any of those. If I want a warm standby, well, that thing's going to be up and running. Now, it might be I can pre-create it and stop it. Like an AKS cluster now, you can actually stop it to stop doing most of that payment. Virtual machines I could stop and I'm then just paying for the disk. So there are ways maybe I can optimize the costs, but realize there's still gonna be some element of the cost there. Now, how is this service used? Because great, I can make sure my state is protected, I can make sure I can recreate the resources, but how does someone actually get to it? So great, I've got this, in this case it's a public IP, so when I'm going via a public endpoint, well, to be any use, I've got some user that goes to the service. Now, how do they go to that service? Have they been given an IP address? Uh, that's a nightmare. You, you do not want that. You don't want things hard-coded with IP addresses. Maybe they have a DNS name. Now, there's different approaches we could take with a DNS name. Now, one of the issues with DNS is a DNS name resolves to an IP address, but I could update the record to if it failed over to another region, it would have a new public IP. You cannot move public IPs between Azure regions. So we get a new public IP. But hey, I could update my DNS record to point to the new public IP. But this ain't got a time to live. To avoid clients constantly, remember it might be constantly talking to this service. I don't wanna to have to do a DNS lookup that takes some time and resources every transaction. Maybe it's doing 100 transactions a second. That'll be a lot of lookups. So there's a time to live, i.e. I'm gonna cache that record for this time to live. If it was one hour, I only look this up every hour. If it was one minute, I'm gonna relook it up every minute. So the longer this value is, the less work on my DNS server, but if I change it, the longer it will take for the client to recognize. So I might have to balance, if I'm gonna update the DNS record, What's the time to live? Or maybe my client, I'll return multiple records. I'll return the record in region one and region two. And then the client's job is to try it, and if it fails, then try the next one. Uh, Active Directory works this way. When I do an NS lookup for a service, 
it returns all the domain controllers, and if one doesn't respond, it will go and try the next one. But these, they, I, don't, I don't really wanna do that. What I would rather do, if I know I'm gonna want to fail over, I would like to put some kind of geo balancer in front of the service and have the users access that instead. Now, if it was a very basic, i.e. maybe it's not HTTP based, I could use Traffic Manager. And then Traffic Manager can point to the different names and instances of the service. It does a health probe to see if they're healthy and return the one that's closest to the user or there's, there's other algorithms I can use. If it was HTTP, HTTPS, I could use Azure Front Door. And once again, it can point to multiple different instances of the service based on where you are. So now it's going to balance to which ones are healthy and additionally, maybe which one is closest to the user as well. So this is a key thing I think about in my architecture. Hey, I probably want to use some geo balancing solutions so I can handle people actually connecting to my service. Now, if it's internally facing, that isn't a public IP, it's a private IP. These don't work. Traffic manager, front door, um, the Azure global load balancer, which is in preview, do not work against private IPs. So I'm probably at that point gonna be using like a network virtual appliance that does handle global internal balancing. That's kind of a, a shortfall today. Also realize when I think about a failover, I've drawn all these different options, okay? So there's, hey, there's different replicas, different databases, different services. Hey, some I'm gonna recreate, some I'm syncing. It's all these different moving parts. And in the event of an actual disaster, I don't wanna be messing about manually doing all of this. So what I really want is a recovery plan. I want, was it kind of those easy buttons that you can just kind of push the easy button and it kind of says that was easy and it does the failover for you. So that easy button in Azure is Azure Site Recovery. So Azure Site Recovery lets me actually go and create a recovery plan, which could be, hey, fail over this VM and then that VM and then run this script, which could maybe start some other things, do this SQL failover, whatever that might be. This is kind of your orchestration. So this is orchestration for your failover. So think of a real disaster. If there was a real disaster, do you think your team is gonna have that kind of sound mind to go through a 20 page failover document? No, if it's a true disaster, they may be thinking about their families and other things going on. And so we really want to make it a seamless experience that, hey, we can document in advance, that we can test. So these sorts of services really help simplify that complete process. Now, when I think about disaster recovery, I focused here on Azure going to another region. Realize that may not be exactly what we're talking about. We may absolutely have kind of an on-premises we might want to use Azure for our disaster recovery. Or maybe we're going to move things and, hey, we're setting Azure up as disaster recovery initially, and what we'll do is a failover to Azure and then leave it there for the migration. So once again, on-premises, we have a bunch of resources that maybe have an operating system, then we have kind of the application, and maybe that thing has data. And we can think about exactly the same options that we can, hey, I can replicate. And again, a lot of the database solutions will let me replicate from on-prem to Azure instances. I can run things like Azure Site Recovery from bare metal, from VMware to Hyper-V to replicate from within the OS to Azure. Um, I can run backup. So my backup data could go and back up to Recovery Services Vault in Azure. So then I could restore into Azure. So there's all these different solutions available. So realize 
it's not just Azure to Azure, it could be like on-premises to Azure as well. Um, on-premises is likely using Active Directory. So I would also have to think about things like domain controllers. Domain controllers are really not a good fit to try and restore. I really would probably want domain controllers running up in Azure IaaS virtual machines. Azure AD is not a replacement for AD. Don't let the naming fool you. So I'd probably want some DCs running. If it's a long-term outage, I probably want Azure AD Connect to be up and running to start synchronizing back with Azure AD. But it, again, it's just another service. It's another application with dependencies that would be part of my planning as well. It would kind of filter all the way down. Now, my next option here, I've been talking all about um, failover. Well, why do we really think about failover? Primarily, it's been for most companies historically, they have a data center. And that data center runs the workload. And then the DR location's really not very good. Uh, we hope we never have to use it. May or may not work. Well, in Azure, that's not the case. In Azure, we have all these regions with all these different capabilities. And we can have multiple regions, not just for resiliency. I might want my workload in multiple regions so it's close to my audience that's using it so they get a better performance because there's lower latency. So I can think about having multiple instances running in multiple regions. So if we come back over to this kind of picture, Actually, we'll redraw, we'll redraw that little architecture. So once again, I can think about, hey, if we have that region one, I'm gonna do a much quicker version of the picture, but hey, we have that app gateway. We have those instances of the service behind the app gateway, remember. We have kind of the Azure functions with the little instances as they're called. We have our database, whatever that might be. And this is kind of both writing and reading to that database. And remember also, these front ends, well, they had an Azure storage account that they were kind of reading from. So we had that whole set of capabilities right there. Okay, fantastic. Well, I can absolutely also have in region two and region three and region four, I might have lots of these running the same thing. Hey, I've got my app gateway, got my instances of service, got my kind of service list layer there, and then I've got my database, copy, where I'm doing reads from. All looks good, fantastic. Um, I can balance between them. So remember my client coming in, well my client coming in would talk to something like Traffic Manager or Azure Front Door, which would be able to resolve to one of those to distribute the traffic. So far, so good. What's gonna drive my ability to do this depends on my app architecture. Realize this is not costing me really any more money. If I have 12 instances running in one region or three instances running in four regions, it's still 12 instances. It's not costing me much more. Now, yes, they have the app gateways, the, the read replicas. Yes, there might be a slight cost, but it's not a huge incremental cost to actually have kind of an active, active scenario up in Azure. So why wouldn't everyone do this? Because remember, this is giving us high availability now as well in a way, because they're actually running in multiple regions and it's given us disaster recovery and it's improving the end user's performance because it will point them to one closest to them. So this, this all seems really a fantastic, with, with no downside. I was didn't see from a single region failure, better performance. Now obviously if a region failed, I then want to take advantage of things like auto scale. Because obviously at that point, if I don't want to draw the arrow that way, I don't like that. We scale in and out. I would add instances, because if this region went down, well, if it's just two regions, I've lost half my capacity. Now, these are hopefully all auto scale anyway, because I get peaks and troughs of load, so it would just auto scale out as more work comes in. 
So I'd want to make sure I consider, hey, what if a region went down in my maximum scale settings? If I'm deployed to four regions and a region goes down, now I've only lost 25%. So the overall hit on any one region would actually be a lot less. But definitely I want to consider auto scale for that. But there's a, there's, a, there's a problem why I might not be able to do this. And it really comes down to the data tier. Because remember, this is where the state is. So if we think back again, remember this is, this is the state. And we talked about most databases are kind of a, a single right scenario, a single main. Well, there's hundreds of miles between these. This is an it's replicating. So we're using an asynchronous replication technology to have a copy in the other region. So if this actually went down, this could fall over and become the primary database. Because of that, this is a read replica. So the local copy of the app can read from it, but it can't write to it. When it wants to write, it has to go across that hundreds of miles. Maybe it's at 40, 50 milliseconds of latency. So this will determine, a lot of the times, if I can support an active-active architecture. Now there are things like Redis Cache, there's, there's other options I can maybe do, Cosmos DB, has different consistency models. I can do a session consistency, so hey, I get consistent read writes within the region, and then it will catch up the others on best it can. But I have to consider this, because if I'm using a regular relational database, I'm gonna have to support this model. That hey, yeah, I can read from my local one, but when I do a write activity, it's gonna have to go across to the main primary. And then make sure I've got code to handle it. If this goes down and this becomes read write, how do I now redirect people to this as the read write instance. Most workloads are very read heavy. If you think about most interactions with a service, hey, I'm looking at what I've bought, um, I'm looking at my profile, I'm looking at blogs. I'm not creating updates to my profile, I'm not creating new transactions. So this may be okay. It really does depend on the application if this is something suitable and again, if this is a direction I want to go, I might reevaluate my data tier. Remember that storage account, remember? Well, it, it had one over here as well that it kind of read from. Well, I could do GRS, and I could do RA, read access GRS, so it's replicating that way again asynchronously to keep that up to date if there were changes. So there were things that I can do to handle that, but I have to think about my complete model. But this is nice, because if we think about from a disaster recovery, I need to plan it. I have to plan my disaster recovery. I need to test it. I need to keep it current. Environments are not static. I'm probably constantly changing this. It's no good creating a DR environment and a DR plan and then leave it. As Soon as this changes, this becomes invalid. So as part of my change control process, I need a step to say, okay, how does it impact my disaster recovery plan? update it and test it. I wanna be doing these failover tests. And so what, the reason Active Active is so nice, it's always running. I'm constantly testing it. So I can actually get a really good degree of confidence that, hey, yeah, I know I, I have this other option. Now, you still need to test because, hey, what happens when I fail over this database? There's still testing you need to do. There's still planning you need to do. But if you're Active Active, well, that replica region or regions is far more ingrained in how I think about things because it's always there. So the key point here is really make sure DR is a core part of my thinking. Ideally, if you can, run this active active. Now, it might cost a little bit more, but it's not a huge amount more because again, instead of six instances in one region, I've maybe got three and three. There's just a few extra little bits that I'm, I'm kind of tagging on. I have to think about where is the state. I have to know what is my recovery point objective, my recovery time objective. So I make the right decisions 
on how I do the replication to meet the need, but not waste money. Hey, if there's no state, just recreate it. Infrastructure as code, DevOps, pipelines can do that for me. Make sure you plan, make sure you test, make sure you keep it updated so it's ready for when you actually need it. Hopefully you never will, but it's there if you did. So that was it. I just wanted to kind of go over kind of those key points when you do think about disaster recovery. You have options. Yes, I can replicate. Yes, I can back up. Yes, I can recreate. The right one depends on where's the state, depends on my RPO, my RTO. So until next time, good luck and take care.